All right, good evening, folks. Good evening, folks. Today is August uh, 16th, 2018. This is episode 107. Oscar Mike Radio is heard on the Hubazoo Network. You can find out more on hubazoo.com. And well, 11 episodes ago, I talked about um, Keith Phillips and the decision for uh, the Navy to overturn uh, the AWOL status and allow him to, in a way, clear his name. And for episode 107, I am honored and pleased to introduce to Oscar Mike Radio, Heath Phillips joining us live. Heath, um, thank you and welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Well, um, hey man, your, your story really you know, hit me in the gut. I, I, I didn't know a whole lot about uh, sexual military trauma, particularly how it affected men. And I, I really hadn't educated myself to the numbers of the situations because not a lot's out there about it. But, but your story was significant as we discussed in episode 96 that, that you had tried 49 times to get help and, and nothing had happened until you really just, you know, for lack of a better term, walked away from it. And that's just hard for me to um, understand. It really is. So <laughs> I, I, I just, I'm, I'm still clueless. And I, I mean, were you able to request MAST or does the, does the Navy work like that, like the Marine Corps does? Or... or did the whole command just say, you know what, well, he's just a 17-year-old kid making noise, we don't care? Um, I'll be honest with you, the, the very first time that I reported, I was immediately the liar. Every single time I reported, they never wanted to, um, like I said um, before, the Exxon knew what was going on, the commander knew what was going on, the master at arms knew what was going on. Nobody, even with me going AWOL, they did nothing, I was never in trouble. So getting a mask, getting any type of hearing, getting anything to happen, they blatantly refused. They they basically pretended like nothing was happening because I was not getting in trouble. The guys doing this to me were not getting in trouble. So it was just like it wasn't happening. It was just strange, man, because that was, that was right around the time that tail hook, you know, the, the, the aftermath of tail hook had happened and tail hook is where the uh, female naval aviator was um, harassed to what degree we'll yeah. never really know but it was enough to where there were major changes made in the military because of it and we got our first real taste of it and when I went to boot camp we were flat out told do not date or fraternize with uh, female Marines just don't do it it's not worth it so it just See, when I went through boot camp my boot camp was in Orlando, Florida. Orlando, Florida is co-ed. Oh, wow. So the first floor was the male recruits. The second floor was empty. Third floor was the females. And all you weren't even, when you were marching down the, anything, the streets, anything, if they ever saw your head glance at the women when you were walking, oh, you were PT to death. So the, it was 1988. Don't look at the women. Don't talk to the women. Don't fraternize with the women. Don't, you know, so it was actually a mindset about women. Never anything ever mentioned about males, but it was mentioned about the women. So one of the things that I came across on a Reddit feed was the, 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 the reason that is that the men are treated differently than the women is uh, the whole thing with having uh, gays serve in the military. I didn't know if there was any validity to that, but it was a common thread that at the time, the political climate didn't really want to do anything to impact gay men being able to serve. And the fact of the matter was uh, the average civilian populace at the time wasn't told about any kind of, of, of male violence in that matter because they didn't want recruiting impacted and I just didn't know if, if there was any kind of validity to that or is it just anecdotal and people talking, telling sea stories? I'll be, I heard the same thing that, um, very similar to what you just said. 
I, if there was any gays that were on board my ship, they um, kept a low profile. My assaulters were not gay, so I don't know about that scenario. Or if they were gay, they were bisexual. I don't, you know, that I don't understand. But the male population, it was a hush you don't talk about. If you find one, you don't talk about it. We need to keep people coming into the military. That that's the biggest thing. Keep them keep them joining. And it's still to, to today um, with all the work in every place that I go to. That is one of the biggest things that th the threat of sexual assault in the military is driving women or males to not enlist because of the constant threat of being sexually assaulted. So that's another interesting point, and and. I'm looking at some of the numbers that are reported about this and I don't understand the numbers and I, and I try to uh, do this in a way that it's not just hearsay. It's not just, um, you know, something I heard in a chat room, but if I understand the numbers correctly, there are like 80,000 uh, reported cases of uh, sexual assault with maybe 3,000 of them getting actually actioned and then a smaller number actually being um, adjudicated down to a legal level. But the thing yes. that... Oh, you have not missed anything on that one. <laughs> well, my, 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 so my next question is, and, 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 I, and, I'm, not, and I'm not trying to... I, the next thing I read was, is that one out of every four women in the military experience sexual trauma. And I have to ask yes, because some form. Yes. That is is that factual? Because if that's factual, why would you want your daughter or yourself to be in that kind of position? It just it it's I can't. Well understand. the reason why the numbers roll out like that, um, like the, it one of the statistics that I read was one in four women or then another one I've read is one in seven women and one in one hundred males. The reason why the percentages come out to that direction, for one, it's done by RAND, um, but it, it's to it, the sexual assault people are the ones that come up with them figures. And my perception of why these figures are said this way is it makes it sound worse. So if you actually look at the individual, how many human bodies, the numbers don't look as bad. So that's why they use the one in four. It makes it sound so horrible because also if you look at it, how many females are in the military um, versus males? Military is a more dominant male um, entity, so that's why their numbers are one in 100. That's another reason why um, when males come forward about sexual assault, we're pushed away more because one in 100. Females are always more looked at and more prominent for a lot of reasons and I don't dispute any of their reasons, but to get back at that, that's why the numbers sound so strange because they do it by, a, you know, one in one, one in four women, or if you heard 20,000 women, which one would you be more concerned about? Oh, the one in four is it's, it just, it just rolls off the tongue. It sounds better and it sounds critical mass. Yes. And that is one of the reasons I learned this several years ago. That is one of the reasons why they use it that way. That's why a lot, a lot of the female organizations use the one in four. It, it, it promotes it more. It makes it sound scarier. And they're truthful. It does make it sound scarier. Wow. So this, this, this happens to you and it, it's, it's terrible. Is it more prevalent in just the Navy and say Marine Corps? Is it more prevalent in all four of the branches? Uh, does that matter at all? Is there any kind of perspective you can offer on that? Uh, I'll be honest, it happens in all. It is, um, I, I can't say which military is more prevalent. I have heard that the Air Force actually was, and I am still trying to find the statistics that way that in saying it through the worst it shouldn't happen anywhere it does happen i think what the worst part is is um how it's being 
being handled as far as um, being adjudicated, how many people are actually being convicted, that I think weighs heavier on me than it does anything because more people are getting away with it than anything. So, so you know, your your incident happened in 1988. It's 2018. So we're looking at what 30 years later. Do you, do yeah. You... Um. My 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 being out of the military's um, 29th anniversary was the 26th of oh, wow. last month. I've been home for 29 years. Oh wow. So um, it's just a little over 30 years that ago that I joined. Do do you see any change in how things are handled? The numbers don't support that, but it, it, I do see that there is from the DOD, and it, it wasn't there because the internet wasn't really a thing when I was in. But there are places you can go on the Department of Defense website to get help outside your chain of command. Is that are we making a step in the right direction, or is it still very much hush hush? <sighs> See, I, I got an issue there. Um, they're trying to pass a uh, military justice improvement act, which will take all the rights away from a commander. I'm still on the fence with that. I am one of the few sexual assault survivors that goes to bases and speaks for um, sexual harassment assault response programs. Um, I'll give you an example. I leave Sunday next week and I will speak next Monday for the criminal investigation division of the army and discuss what happened to me and where I see things now and how they can change things. That is one of the benefits that I have that um, these senators and Congress people don't have. They're not there, they're not in the ranks. They're only going by cases and a lot of the cases are old. And I, I from what I was in, that now I have seen an incredible difference on how things are reported and how things are handled. My um, attorney who represented me when I was in in 1989, we tracked him down when I was get, doing my paperwork for my upgrade and he and his affidavit stated, listen, if this would have happened to Phillips in this day and age, this would have happened, this would have happened, this would have happened, he wouldn't have been discharged. And so Things have been stepping up. Does it need improvement? Yes. Well, like anything, it's just not a simple fix. <laughs> well, that that legislation you're referring to, if I remember correctly, it 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 does. It takes any kind of um, punitive oversight away from command and shifts it to on a civilian tribunal or or oversight yes, court. Yes, uh, civilian. It, it basically shifts it to civilian, which will. Um, unfortunately result in overburdening the civilian sector on these things because they're going to have to run back and forth between the base. I, and then the other thought was putting them right on base. Each base have their own, which promotes more jobs. But this is the other way I look at it. If politicians take this part of commanding away from commanders, what are they going to start taking away next if they have the power to do it now? And that's how I look at it. It has nothing to do with the sexual assault and it has to do with what else are they going to take away? What else are they not going to be happy with? Because, and, because isn't, isn't the, the Navy, as I understood it when I was in, is a, let's just take a ship, for example. Like the captain truly is the first and last you know, person on that ship. He has complete yeah. control over everything that happens. He he is, um, you know, he or she is a figurehead, followed by the EXO, and then, you know, the enlisted staff, so on and so forth. And there's a lot of latitude, from what I understand, that they're given that, say, maybe somebody in the Air Force flying a C-5 may not have. Um, I, I would rather see more more of a unified um, direction on how cases should be handled and maybe have joint handling more than just stripping it from a commander. I think two people should be put in charge instead of one. Have a civilian, have a commander, have them work together, not have the commander stripped of everything. I personally think cases would be handled better. 
Is it just you know, the, the thing with a commander is if it's their buddy, they're going to let them go. That's what I, excuse me, I see that they're using as their reasoning on why to take it away from them. Yeah, but I, I, I go back to the only the only recent one that comes to mind, um, and it's not really in this realm, but where it, it did have a negative impact on a career was Petraeus. Uh, once, yes. Once once they found out that he in fact you know committed infidelity with the person that he did it with, and she had access to the information, I don't know if that was the linchpin as to why he got relieved of command, but certainly. Uh, they, they they ruled him ineffective and and didn't fool around, uh, which we always think as enlisted guys that the officers get a free pass and it, it didn't happen this time. But that's a different conversation for a different time. <laughs> this, this all happens. Well, you're correct though. This all happens though, man. And 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 and, and Heath, I, I'm just I'm looking and one of the things that's just like wow, this is really an amazing. Uh, story and, 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 a, and an individual I really want to talk to is you've taken this and really kept the fight going. You you go to bases and talk. You talk to people that are going through this, and so I, I kind of to hear about that. What's what's it like going on base and having these kinds of talks with personnel, both officer and listed about this? Um, our, it, I'll, at first it was a little nerve wracking. Um, I've been doing it. I think this will be my fourth year actually going on bases. I, you know, I spoke about it beforehand, but to actually go back in the military and do it that way, it, this will be my fourth year. The first time I was scared. Um, I won't lie. I was very, very scared. The more and more I started doing it, I still get butterflies. I'm still nervous. I'm still scared. But the the afterwards, the, you know, the calm is so much greater but not only that, I've had, I'll give you an example. I, today, I just had a, a commander email me. He actually um, was overseas on duty right now. He's in the National Guard, but he is the head commander of the United States National Guard. He sent me an email congratulating me, one, for my upgrade. He was really ecstatic hearing it. And for two, wanting to know when I was going to come speak at his base again. He is uh, out of um, Los Alamos, California. So getting things like that is really impressive. It makes me feel like I, I'm making a difference. For me, it's all about helping other people. It's making sure people do not know what I went through. I had a bad time for 20 years. I, I don't want to see anybody happen to do that. Ever since um, I became sober, it became a drive. Ever since I found out that there are other people that went through similar situations as I did, it became a drive. When I go on these bases, I believe it or not, I actually have enlisted. I've had um, officers come and talk to me one on one after my presentation and talk to me about how this happened to them, or they know somebody that happened to, or I did a um, actually the commander that has emailed me today. It was at his base. I had a major come up to me and he hugged me, which I'm still kind of offish about men hugging me. <laughs> And he was crying wait, though. But wait, 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 hold on. Wait, wait, wait. A major hug you? Is are you sure that yeah. he's real? Yeah. Yeah. And he was crying, which made it even yeah. weirder. Um he thanked me for what I did. He thanked me for sharing and he was like still trying to have his hand on my shoulder and I kinda like stepped back a little bit just because I I felt uncomfortable like that. And he's like, um, you raise awareness to me that I never, he goes, I've been in the military for a long time. He goes, I've heard things. I, you know, he goes, I've always heard from women. He goes, you're the first male I've ever heard talk about this. He goes, my 18 year old son is in the army and he's in a school. He goes, when I get done talking to he goes, I'm going to go back to my place and I'm going to call him and talk to him. And I was just like, wow. Okay. And, but that's all he said. It, it, it kind of threw me, and then I, um, after he walked away, I had a lady came up, and I really didn't pay attention. I know she was a sergeant, but I didn't really pay attention to what she was, and she shared with me that she was harassed and that somebody kept grabbing her inappropriately, and thanked me for sharing, walked away, 
the very next day before I left, I had a person from the uh, Sexual Harassment Assault Response Program call me and tell me that a lady came in and shared with them about somebody touching them and thanked me for having the courage to come forward because it gave her the courage. Oh, wow. You know, those things make it worth it. So, you know, I mean, how do, you, how, do, how do you feel about that? I mean, I mean, you know, something very terrible happened to you and, and you're, you're, you've taken it and, and done this. I mean, when you hear that, what's going through your mind when you hear that? That I'm glad that my horrible experiences can help them not have it. That, that's my big thing. I've already gone through everything. There's, there's not much more left for me to have to go through except for passing away. You know, I, <laughs> I've done probably everything rotten in life and everything good in life. So I, if my out good weighs my bad 20 years, then I'm going to be a happy man when I pass away. But it's very hard felt when you have somebody come and talk to you like that. I have people reach me on Facebook. I don't even know who they are. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was just on the Megan Kelly Today show on um, July 2nd. For two weeks, my Facebook was just blown up from survivors that I've never met, never talked to, reaching out to me, wanting to talk, talk to me, asking me questions. Military male survivors, I have probably at least 200 of them that's reached out to me. And I refer a lot of them to, I do a lot of pro bono. I'm not an attorney, but I'm part of a uh, pro bono group. So I, I attach people to pro bono veteran attorneys. Oh, wow. That's so, awesome. you know, I've been, I've been connecting these guys to, you know, different attorney groups. Um, I'm like I do I speak at a couple of different law schools and they have veteran clinics and they do all pro bono work so I you know that's what I do I introduce them to these people I'm like here this person's in your area reach out to them or um, an organization that I've been ever since I came out and started talking um, they're called protect our defenders I refer them to them because they also have a an extensive pro bono um, attorney network um, a lot of it's the same one that I have, but we each also have different attorneys that we deal with. So knowing that I can help these people in any direction is, I don't know, also makes me feel good. So I'm, I'm, I'm blown away by that because a lot of times it takes just one person taking that step forward and saying enough's enough and you're making real change from a situation that a lot of people would have just not talked about at all. And, you know, with yeah. PTSD being a huge problem, uh, it's not just combat that can cause PTSD type situations. You got to feel that there's it is, well, all sorts of different things can cause PTSD. A lot of people don't realize you don't have to be in combat to have PTSD. I, I really don't like that myth. I hear it a lot. Well, how do you have PTSD? PTSD, you were never in combat. What I went through was just like combat. So, you know, it, it's kind of crazy that people still insist that. So I'm a parent and I served. So my next, my next thing I want to talk about is if, if I'm a parent and my kid is, you know, calling me and, you know, asking me for stuff like the, you know, a lot of military kids do and all of a sudden it stops and, you know, I think there's something wrong and, you know, maybe I get him or her to tell me what the deal is. You know, I guess the first thing is what, what should a military person do if this happens to them to, to, to make sure that, that they're heard? And then how can parents, friends, and family support that if they become aware of it? My, my biggest thing for me, um, like I have six children. I have three that are old enough to serve all three. I've never said they couldn't. They know what I went through. I spoke with this um, parent just recently. She is from Seattle, Washington. Her daughter's there. Her daughter didn't tell her mom anything. And I told the mom, um, 
mom's really worried. She goes, you know, I've seen a lot about you. How do I talk to her? And I says, you, you, you be honest with them. You be up front. You be the parent that, you know, a lot of us sometimes think we are, but we're not. And you be honest with them. And it, for, it's always baby steps. Nothing's just ever cut and dry. And she slowly started talking to her daughter, and her daughter finally came out, and it, you know, came out like an eggshell, a little piece at a time. But her daughter told her how she went out drunk and someone did something to her, and she wasn't aware until the next day when she found um, the guy's um, condom laying next to her. And so she was really upset, didn't know how to take it. And as I tell most people, and as I told her, first thing you guys do is think of the child. Think of the person, uh, unfortunately, they're a victim at this point. And it's not about the parent going off the handle because it generally makes things worse. And I'm saying that from my own experience. Um, have them talk to them mental health. Have them reach out to the command. Whoever they can feel trust with, the worst thing anybody can do as a victim or a survivor or whatever is keep it bottled in and not share it. I uh, I shared things with my family, but I kept 90% of everything bottled in. It's probably one of the hardest things for any parent to have to hear. Oh, I'm sure. And it's probably one of the hardest things for a child to tell their parent. And if you have a strong enough bond in between yourselves, it's still not an easy task to talk about. But as I bear witness to my own self, even it in will destroy you more than sharing it. As far as the command goes, if you know about it, is you go through the chain of command just like you were enlisted. And if chain of command does not work, the great thing about the military now is they do have SHARP, the Sexual Harassment Assault Response Program. They have hotline numbers to call. I saw those. There's So there's hotline numbers that, that you can reach out to for the base that they're in. If you're still not comfortable with that and you don't think you're getting a good enough response, um, I hate doing this, but this is always a last resort. Reach out to your senator or congressperson and then pray that they're one of the ones that uh, are willing to help. I know a lot of them that just, they do a lot of lip service and that's it. Well, there, there have been a couple in different situations over the years that I've seen, like you said, step up to the plate and take it and run with it. Some of them, some of them don't, but I, I don't know, politically, it's almost suicide if you don't help somebody. I don't know how they justify not getting involved, but... Look at this Congress guy here with the um, the coaching teams there that kept coming to him about something and he did nothing about it. Oh, in Ohio, he, he, yeah. He's getting some, yeah, he's getting some uh, feedback bad about that. True, true. Uh, I guess the last one that I, I read about was the senator who helped the uh, submariner. He, he was going to be arrested for uh, failing to show up in court, and the senator got involved. There's also the Army uh, st staff sergeant and captain who were going to get arrested for killing that Taliban or not, that uh, Afghan police yeah. officer. Uh, yeah, I was going to say the one officer there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they got a big boost from politicians so uh, but you're right if it's not election year maybe they, you won't get the help they need but it certainly seemed like looking at sharp and looking at the DOD's website and looking at some of the base resources on some of the bigger bases that I was able to see I, I do agree with you that if, if you do have this problem there there are multiple ways to deal with it um, I, I know just from being the Marine Corps that your command would prefer that you you know go to them first but if <laughs> well, is the you problem, keep it in house with them. <laughs> well, that's the problem. And if you're if you're if your XO is friends with uh, you know some first sergeant or, or you know some other guy from a different wing, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. It's just not. So 
I don't know what to say, but uh, about that. But I, I just, I just think that uh, this, this is a bigger problem than because you had, you had eight, like eight, almost 80, 90,000 people file claims in the. It was twenty sixteen, I think, it was the last year they actually produced numbers on this. And out of a military, uh, right now uh, the the Pentagon won't release the the recent stuff. There's a big um, fight over that right now. Okay. How they're not releasing the um, newest numbers, and it's got it broke down by bases, which is fantastic. Well, it's fantastic to find out if they would release it. It's uh, one of the things that I've been working on with a uh, Congress member Custer is uh, military sexual assault transparency and accountability bill that is sitting in the NDAA right now waiting to be voted on, which I fingers crossed it passes. It's um, basically helps for collateral misconduct, similar to like you were just mentioning if the commander's friends with the first sergeant, um, first sergeant gets away with it. Well, now, now we're getting accountability and finding out what actually really happens to each case because we don't have that. Nobody knows what happens actually from each case. So that's kind of what that bill is for. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, so I do a lot of things. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, it's, it's obvious. I, I really, like I said, Heath, I was really taken in by your story when it, it broke and I started looking at it. I'm like, you know, Oh my God, 49 times. And he had to go AWOL to finally get his case heard. And then it took almost 30 years to get, get it rectified. And a lot of people would have handled it differently. Instead, you've taken it and, and made it something different. And people gain help with it. It just really um, drove home that all it takes is one person to make a difference. It, it really does. Um, yeah, I just had a friend, a um, childhood friend. He uh, stopped at my house the other night. I haven't seen him. I seen him once last year when I was down at Fort Bliss speaking. But... I haven't seen him in probably 15 years and he was here last uh, two nights ago. And he's like, uh, you know, he, he says, I know a lot of stuff. He's, I'm really proud of you. He says, I don't see that many people. He says, but there's one thing that you need to know. He says, and I guarantee you probably don't realize it is the impact that just you alone do for so many people and how that's just going to generate to other generations just by what you do. And I'll be honest with you, it took me almost a whole day to comprehend what he meant. <laughs> Not that I'm slow, it just it, it was like, oh my God, you know, now now I really understand what he means. Yeah, because because you're you're, 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 you're I don't look at it that way. Well, you're in the trenches. You you, you said you 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 everything that has could happen to you almost has happened to you, and you've come through it. So your your perspective has to be different than someone like mine or. Like your friend who's lived up close to you and seen, you know, you 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 fight this for for three plus decades, and are still involved with it. If if somebody wants to get involved with this, or somebody you know is a uh, survivor and hasn't come out yet, and maybe they're out of the military, where could they go uh, to to make this an issue or to get help? Is the VA a good place, or well, is, is it? Uh, the VA is depends on the location. Um, a few years ago, I traveled not the whole U.S., but quite a bit of the U.S., visiting VA hospitals, mainly to look for um, mail, what, what the mail MST atmosphere was like. And um, every place is different. How they handle things is different. That's actually something I'm trying to work on too but that's for another day but one of the things there's organizations also out there um swan service woman action network they are really huge on helping women it's a fantastic phenomenal organization i would promote them all the time you have um believe it or not the american legion the not the legion at your hometown but the american legion like national, they help people. You have the organization I spoke about earlier, Protect Our Defenders. They are constantly in the media over mainstreaming against the military for sexual assault and helping survivors. 
Um, I'm actually on their advisory board. I don't do a lot with them because I do a lot of my own things. But I would recommend them. One thing I tell a lot of people is, um, and it's nothing against VSOs, I tell them that if you're doing an appeal, get a certified veteran's attorney. That's part of what took me so long was VSO screwing up my cases. And, you know, like I said, it's not against VSOs, but um, a lot of them are not trained. You know, they get the job and then they learn as they're doing it. Or you can have the guy like I had who was in for 20 years and just didn't care and just submitted your paperwork missing half of the stuff. Oh, man. Ugh. Yeah, I, uh, my first time I filed was in 2003. And he what? didn't file everything. Yes. 2003, my paperwork was filed. They screwed it up because he didn't file everything. He lied to me, told me I could not appeal it. <laughs> and, of course, back then I was still a drunk. When I became sober in 2009, the VSO that replaced him was like, oh, no, you should have appealed this. And he went off the same case. And my... Upgrade was denied, but after an appeal from 2010 to 2015, I, I took over my own case. I won in 2015, and I'm 100% service connected for PTSD, and it's unheard of for somebody that had an other nominal discharge to actually get granted service connected, let alone what I what else I got from it. But if it wasn't for me reading the laws and studying everything, I probably would never want any either. But it, right now, I'm still trying to get the appeals division in D.C. to hear my case to have it go back to 2003 because, unfortunately, not only did my guy screw up things, the VA never even looked at all the evidence. <laughs> so my case should have never even been closed in the first place per technicalities and laws and cases and other dumb things but you know I prefer organizations before I prefer the VA the VA is for the VA gotcha. uh, I'll, I'll give you another prime example I'm going to mental health at the VA they told me that there is no way that I was in my right state of my mind when I was being sexually assaulted and beaten on board this ship and that, you know, that was an excusable reason why I went AWOL because, you know, I wasn't in my right state of mind because of what was happening. But because this employee works for the VA, they cannot write that, but they can tell me personally, but they can't write it. Now, one of the technicalities for um, an appeal if you have, like me, I went AWOL more than one time, is to be listed as temporary insane, which was basically what this mental health lady told me, that because of what was happening, I wasn't in my right state of mind. I had to go outside of the VA to see private mental health for almost a year, and then they wrote me a letter stating that, and that's what got my appeal started. But because the VA mental health lady works for the VA, she couldn't do it. That's no, I, the technicalities I, that you get into. No, and it goes back to people don't understand, civilians don't understand that you, your, your point about paperwork being filled out, where, where, where I, I have had guys tell me they had, and they showed me, you know, they had one section that was wrong or incomplete, and their default thing is just to trash the entire application or shelve it and say it's not complete and you got to go through and do it again and it just takes another three four months to get a hearing all that stuff set up again so it, it, it's gonna be very frustrating not to mention when you, you're, you're you're the the team you, the, that you think is on your side is not really on your side not really, really being your advocate so you're saying to 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 not hold it in do not hold this in do not carry this weight around with you your entire life Definitely. seek help seek help there is definitely and speak out i mean i, I tell everybody there, there's nothing to be ashamed of being a survivor or a victim um to me um i was a victim up until 
I started talking about it. Once I started talking about it, I became a survivor because now I'm moving forward. Gotcha. That's for me. I'm not saying that's for everyone. That was for me. Um, you have to somehow release it. Otherwise, you're going to be messed up. I don't want to assume, but I would say that you have, uh, you were a victim, you have survived, and now you're, you're taking this and helping other people survive. I just, um, I don't, I don't know. I, 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 I see what passes for a hero nowadays. I see what passes for people doing the right thing. And I know there's a trust issue or trust factor with a uh, command. You know, from the day I stepped in the yellow footprints, I was told that if I had a problem, it would be resolved. And, and, and so I hope that, that, you know, officers start taking this seriously, or maybe they are now. I don't know, Heath. And when the this... younger ones are, and that, I, that's the, the trend that I'm seeing. Um, the older ones, there's nothing against them because they've been in there and they're set so much in their old school way. But the newer ones I have seen are taking a greater interest and are more understanding and more um, forthcoming on helping people. Well, that's good to hear, man. That's good to hear. So I know you travel around a whole lot and would definitely. Um like to keep in touch with your um, so many activities looking at your Twitter feed it, it's, it's <laughs> I got way too many activities <laughs> I'm like oh my god I mean <laughs> you're you're uh, you, you never stop moving it seems like and, and I, I guess in a way that's that's good that you can provide that help but also kind of shows how much more needs to be done because it's a problem it's still a problem it, it is and I'll, I'm be honest with you I'm getting tired Sometimes I take my breaks and because I'm getting tired. But um, unfortunately, there's there's not enough. Um, and I'm saying not not referring to like staying as in like um, a, a normal person, but there's not enough uh, sane survivors to actually go do what I do. A lot of them have a hard time doing it. Um, they they not really relapse, but they have more issues from coming forward than in the spectrum like I do, gotcha. you know, going to bases and being in the media and at events. Um, there's not a lot of survivors that can do that. And it's, it's unfortunate for me because I'm the one that has to take, you know, the blunt for everything, but somebody has to do it. I, I've met numerous, numerous people that I've shared and I've actually brought on board and had them speak with me at events and, you know, they'd call me the next day, and they're like, oh, I can't do this again. And I'm like, oh, oh, man. But we have one more, and they're like, I can't do this again. <laughs> it was way too much. I couldn't sleep last night. And I, was, you know, I understand. You know, this is not meant for everybody. Some of them, some people are not at the same stage of healing. Well, and I don't want people to have more of an issue coming forward and trying to talk like I do than calling me up and saying, hey, Heath. Can we talk? And it's like, yeah, sure. So I like doing that too. So I'm getting that, that again, don't hold it in. Seek help. Sometimes outside the military is the best way to go. You're, 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 you're a victim, then you're a survivor, and then you're someone who can take action. And you don't have to be alone. And, and there's certainly, right. certainly better ways to deal with this than... Uh, the end result of uh, PTSD sometimes. Well, I just want to thank you yeah, for coming on. Yeah, personally. Oh, go ahead. Hey, it was my pleasure. Sometimes I'm long-winded and I apologize. No, it's all right. It's all right. I, I mean, I, I just, uh, again, it, it kind of hits home. I never experienced this in the Marine Corps or, or knew anybody who had this happen. It, it just really reached out to me because we're, we're told to trust our command. We're told that our that our their officers and senior staff enlisted, you know, really want the best for us. And it, it was just striking that this was done this way. And then I, I I read the numbers and I can't figure out why they sound the way they do. And then I wonder what what could I do if, if somebody called me up tomorrow and you know told me their story. I think I have enough of a of a of a of a to do list that I could at least point them in the right direction. I didn't have that before, so thank you. Yeah, I'm glad I am able to help. Well, Heath, uh, 
Mr. Phillips, uh, thank you again for your time. Definitely, uh, I would like to have you back on any time that you want to come back on and update us or just uh, maybe provide some some comfort to somebody or, or, or tell us something that has changed in the legal or political landscape. And uh, you can see links to uh, Protect Our Defenders and some of his outreach that he's done on the Oscar Mike radio blog post. He thank you.